this semester I'm teaching a new class. Actually, this year I taught two new classes. Um, last semester I taught a seminar on aging and narrative. And this semester I'm teaching a course on what I'm calling the philosophy of memoir. And broadly, it's asking questions about the borderlands of philosophy. Um, where does philosophy end and other disciplines begin? It's kind of challenging what's relevant to a philosophical discussion, whether um, and what place first personal accounts might have in philosophy. And um, so we're asking questions both about philosophy told from the first person with respect to, um, for example, questions about personal identity. What makes me the same person across time? Is it something about my body or is it some kind of coherence to my story? Um, and then we're asking some questions about epistemology, about um, the kinds of injustices that might creep in. So where somebody's not believed because their account is um, a marginalized account um, and how the fact that somebody has a marginal voice might um, play into the person's believability, but also their own self-conception. And then in the end of the class, we're asking questions about collective action and the role of first personal accounts in collective action and whether kind of reading memoirs might encourage the kind of thinking, kind of like we reasoning um, that is needed to solve collective action problems. So the end of the class, we're looking at questions about um, environmental ethics. So anyway, that's what I'm teaching this year. I'll let Troy say a little bit about what Troy is doing, and then we'll think about the major and what it looks like at Reed. Yeah, um, first of all, thanks everybody for, for coming. Um, I hope we get a chance to engage with you all and, and answer your questions. I'm Troy Cross. I've been here maybe 11 years now. I don't know. I don't want to think about it. A long time. And. Um, it's a real pleasure and a real privilege to teach in this department. We has so many amazing students. I like my colleagues. I uh, like the college. Yeah, you especially, Meg. Thanks. And um, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of intense department, but uh, I think a fun department too. Uh, yeah, about myself. Let's see. Uh, I teach metaphysics and epistemology, roughly, the theory of being or what there is, and also theory of knowledge. What is knowledge? What is justification? What do we know? How much knowledge do we have? What's it possible to know? And uh, let's say right now I'm teaching three classes, a class in the philosophy of religion, uh, mostly like classical arguments for God's existence, uh, really an introduction to philosophy by way of philosophy of religion, um, a class on uh, metaphysics. It's mostly been on basic ontology, what, what there is, um, properties, objects, time. We're doing time right now. Is time real? Uh, and what is time? And we'll do time travel as well. Is it possible? Is it paradoxical? Is it logically possible? We're not actually trying to build a machine in the class. We, it's just like, do these stories of time travel actually make sense or are they incoherent when you think about them carefully? What are the different models of time travel that might make sense? Um, yeah, well, maybe it doesn't even get to the physics department because we philosophers figure out that it's actually incoherent. Okay. Um, and I'm also teaching a class on testimony and trust, which I was just saying as you all came in, I didn't realize you were coming in. Um, it's about uh, really the, the social nature of knowledge. We, in, in the history of philosophy, you may, have, you may have heard, I think, therefore I am. You may have heard of Descartes wondering whether he's dreaming or whether he's a victim of some evil genius. He calls it godlike being that deceives him into thinking everything that he does, even though it's false. Traditionally, epistemology is very first personal endeavor. It's very much like Descartes imagines him sitting in a gown by the fireside and wondering, is there anything really outside of my own head? You know, he's like, I see people 
walking by, but am I just looking at coats and hats? And in fact, is there anything at all? Or am I just a mind, right? Very first personal, and that's the starting point for contemporary epistemology. But actually we rely on each other for everything. This is no surprise to you all, you know, uh, but, but you inherit your belief from authorities, parents, teachers, uh, political figures, but also peers and social networks. And the question is like, how are you ever justified in believing someone else? And some people in philosophy think that form of justification is absolutely basic, it's core. And others think that people basically have to earn your trust in order for you to trust them. And you come up with a theory that trusting them is better than not trusting them, All right? So this class is kind of about that debate and this proper structure of epistemic authority. Uh, what else about me? Oh, uh, other interests I've got right now, <laughs> uh, I'm interested in money, uh, like actual, uh, I'm actually interested in having money. No, no, I'm interested in what money is, not so much in having money. I've never been that interested in having money, but I'm very interested in what it is. Uh, in, in particular, the new forms of monetary-like assets in the digital space, um, both like what their value is, what they are, how they operate, what their effects could be on society, but also what they should be, what money should be, um, what what have we baked into our existing conception of money that embeds norms? Uh, and are those norms based on uh, an overall great vision for, uh, for society? And are they based on an accurate historical anthropological understanding uh, or not? So it's kind of like, what is money? What should it be? What could it be? And why do we think it is what we think it is? That's the stuff I'm thinking about most of all right now. I don't know if you've seen, you know, Aristotle has stuff on this. Did you read that in the politics? Of course, I started with Aristotle. For those of you here, you know, Meg studies Aristotle. Basically, Aristotle invented everything, <laughs> or, or he didn't invent it, but he claimed credit for it or whatever, but it's all there. So, yes, of course, I start with Aristotle, and so do the 18th and 19th, the 19th century economists who, uh, who kind of reinvent Aristotle. They just kind of read, Javon's basically reinvents Aristotle. Um, doesn't really give give Aristotle credit, but you know, uh, yeah, money as a as a as a way of solving the the problem of co coincident wants. I have something you want, you don't have anything I want. How do we make an exchange? Or money as the thing which is not desired for itself, but for other things that it can buy, where you know other goods are desired for themselves, right, Meg? Yep. Well, I mean, Aristotle is saying, you know, making money is ultimately for the sake of the human good. And so money making that is just for maximizing money has lost track of what money making is for. Money making needs to be understood in this kind of un under this wider umbrella. Um, so maximizing money is, is like a kind of a fake money making or it's not the real art of money making. That was, that's broadly what Aristotle would say. So the real money art of money making is making money so that you can be, you can be benevolent with your friends, for instance. And uh, you know, you go to dinner and you get to treat. Like that's funny. Money, uh, money allows you to spend more time doing philosophy or making art. And that's the point. If you're, if you're, if you're playing a game where you're living a bad life in order to maximize money, something has gone horribly wrong. Aristotle's diagnosis still holds very much in our society. Yeah. yeah. See, like you can see why we take such a low salary here. At Reed. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem. Don't let the administration know we're having this conversation. I I thought you guys were just doing it for the greater good, like you know, <laughs> just, like just like I I'm pretty sure Plato did not put a salary on uh, on teachers for the academy or teach for free, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, for him, the cost was the cost of doing philosophy was death. So, yeah. Anyway, thank that, you that, so that's, much. That's 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 where you go way beyond money. Thanks for that wonderful introductions. I was philosophy majors uh, when I was undergraduate, so I definitely miss all these discussions. So, if you guys could, you know, help us kind of get the lay of the land, like if a students 
you know, uh, was to come to read and just pursue philosophy, you know, for their four years here. What does that look like? What kind of, if there's any kind of specialty that they could focus on, like what areas of, of specialties uh, does our department focus on? Philosophy is such a humongously large field, like, you know, with over 25 centuries of histories and, you know, self view behind that. I, I remember when, when I was in in, uh, in college, my, my professor was like, so you want to do like epistemology, but like medieval or like modern? And I'm like, wait, what? They're, they're like even timeline, which you want to do? So obviously, so if you could help us understand like what does it take to, to be a philosophy major at Reed? Do you, Trey, do you want to say a little bit about what other people who are not from our department who are not present work on? And then I could say a little bit broadly about what it might look like to do philosophy at Reed versus elsewhere? Okay, sure. Um, Mark Bedeau is a philosopher of biology who does a lot of work on the sort of at the edge of philosophy and other disciplines. Philosophy and computation, he works on a lot, modeling complex systems, asking about how life emerges from non life. And um, he's a really prolific researcher who involves a lot of students in his research uh, at kind of the intersection of biology, computer science, and uh, philosophy, just a terrific, uh, terrific teacher and colleague. Uh, Mark Hinchliff kind of works what I work on, a lot of metaphysics. He does time. He's got, written a massive book yet to be published on the philosophy of time, uh, which is excellent also teaches epistemology teaches early modern philosophy that is like Descartes uh, Spinoza Leibniz Locke Barclay Hume these kind of major figures in Western philosophy in uh, the enlightenment kind of era era and teaches logic um, speaking of logic Paul Havda is our resident logician Paul also does metaphysics we got a lot of metaphysicians in the department Meg does too because Aristotle does it so have to do it. Um, uh, yeah, Paul teaches advanced logic classes, uh, as well as the intro logic class and, and, and classes on metaphysics like uh, material constitution, when do some things form another thing, um, and uh, questions on questions of necessity and possibility. What is it to say something is must be the case as opposed to just being the case? Uh, uh, Steve Arkonovich teaches ethics and uh, again, philosophy of persons, teach a class called Persons and Their Lives, which is partly about personal identity, what it is to be a person, free will, and um, partly about ethics. And he does social political philosophy as well, to some degree. Am I on target roughly, Meg? What am I leaving yep. out? Yep, yep. You, yeah, so that's kind of, that's who we are, kind of what our areas of research are. But I have to say one fun thing about being at RAID, in fact, I was just this past weekend, I spent the past weekend with one of my friends from graduate school at UCLA. And I was saying one thing that I love about RAID that I think has really made me a better philosopher and could make you a better one too, and that is this kind of opportunity to do a lot of things. I feel like if you have an interest in philosophy, you can make it happen in our department. Um, and you could, you could start with anything for your senior thesis project. So for example, I have a senior thesis student right now who ended up through, um, so his, his grandmother went to Reed. His grandmother was married in the Reed Chapel his grandmother went into hospice and because of some circumstances, he was the one to take care of her in hospice. And he recognized that in that hospice setting, there were things happening that he didn't think were good. And he wanted to see how philosophy could address this question of what should hospice care look like and how could you move it from what it is now to a better model? So anyway, he just came to my office with that idea at the beginning of the year and he is writing this really incredible thesis about um, how do we understand um, what quality of life means in the mission statement for hospice. And he comes up with a different kind of metric that is the analog to a metric that um, 
people advocate for in pediatrics, because pediatrics needs to kind of be attend not only to kind of the present condition of the person, but needs to be future oriented and thinking about how that individual grows into an adult. And he argues, similarly, hospice needs to attend not only to the kind of present condition of the person, but really needs to attend to their kind of impending future death, but also to their past. How can, how can hospice kind of um, clarify the kind of diachronic character of a human life and embed that into the very mission that they aim to accomplish? So there is an example, you know, none of us are, you know, hospice specialists, but all of us, you know, have little pieces to contribute. And then, you know, I was able to work with this um, doctor at OHSU, that's the, the um, research hospital here. He's going to be a member of my student's um, board for his oral exams on his senior thesis. This is by way of saying anything's possible here. And he's using things that he learned in multiple classes and bringing them to bear on something he actually cares about that actually could make a difference outside of read and outside of philosophy. So I guess I would say broadly, you will just come to think better and to synthesize multiple areas of philosophy if you come here. And that's in part because of the way we operate in our classrooms through this kind of really rich exchange. And you're coming to class um, already prepared to really dig into all of these um, philosophical issues. And we kind of develop all together, me included, a kind of habit of mind of how do you um, pick apart problems and divide, <laughs> divide and conquer problems, essentially, um, and what areas could be brought to bear areas of philosophy could be brought to bear on novel questions. So, I mean, Troy is demonstrating that in, you know, thinking about Bitcoin or whatever. Troy is essentially like bringing philosophy to something novel, a novel thing, which is Bitcoin. How do you bring philosophy to it? And that's the same thing my student is doing. I, I have this problem with hospice. How can I bring philosophy to it? How does it enrich it or um, help us see through a problem into a potential um, better solution. So I think that's a really valuable aspect. And then another thing that I think is really distinguishes Reed, if you're looking at different places, um, is just that senior thesis opportunity to work closely with um, one of us in, um, and even like in my case of my student, even with an outside person that I was able to find for, for him. But um, how do you come up with a project, essentially assign yourself a class, write your own syllabus, and carry out a year-long project. That is so valuable, no matter what you're going to end up doing. So um, that's a really huge opportunity. And then we have these weekly lunches. And so I was just there today. This uh, A senior thesis student presented on his thesis on what is a right to privacy how do we how do we conceive of rights to privacy? He went he ran through a bunch of um, alternative positions and then offered what he takes to be a better um, a better account of a right to privacy. But th those are opportunities you have too to kind of on a weekly basis come hear from either a professor or a fellow student um, and actually help impact that thesis, make it better through your discussion. And then we also have great colloquia. We have, you know, really fantastic philosophers that we invite to come to read. This just happened last Friday, Elizabeth Barnes, um, who's really written the most groundbreaking book in the philosophy of disability. She came and spoke with us about um, a new project. She has a book called Minority Body that has, has gained a lot of purchase, but she is the, the book that she was presenting is in its infancy, but of course, as a question and answer session, we can all help influence her work. We can all help think through the new things that she's thinking about. Um, and so her lecture was on um, disability and its relationship to health. So anyway, there's a lot possible, but I think that um, the kind of on the ground, 
engagement that we have here in our department is really what makes a huge difference. Yeah, I, I just want to just want to add a little bit to what Meg said. Mm -hmm. um, the senior thesis is what's really special, and the whole education is really geared towards the thesis because it's hard to write, uh, you know, a thirty to 40, 50,000 word document on your own over a year. That's a very hard task to try to make an original contribution to philosophy. So the rest of the education is really designed to put you in a position to do that. You know, at the 200 level, our course is really focused on short writing assignments and in-class participation and careful reading that teach you how to read a text, looking for the kind of argumentative skeleton of that text, being able to reconstruct it accurately and get your mind into the mind of the writer so that you're able to recapitulate the central points and the thesis and the argument of a piece that you read. Once you learn to kind of internalize argumentative structure, you can start picking it apart. You can start criticizing. And once you start criticizing, you can also start repairing or rebuilding a position yourself, right? So it's like first understand and read and learn basic communication in philosophy and then start layering criticism on that. And then on top of the criticism, layering building yourself, right? And then we have a junior seminar when you hit junior year, second semester junior year, where you undertake a, what is it? 5,000 5, word essay that you must write over that course to basically qualify for thesis. And you have a professor in that class who helps you learn to do a longer, you know, less structured project. So it's basically like all designed to build little pieces, bigger pieces, much bigger piece thesis. And also because, you know, you'll come to these lunches and you'll participate in colloquia and you'll participate in class. There are seminars that you'll do a lot of participation in you will learn to trot out your ideas in front of everybody else and criticize everybody else's ideas and build uh, verbally as well as in written work, right? So the culmination of that is you write a senior thesis, you have an hour and a half oral exam and you're prepared for both parts of that experience. Uh, the, the research, the design of the project, the execution of the writing, oh, the refinement of the writing, and then uh, defending that idea with four professors, three of whom are in your department. And uh, that's really, really special. And I just have to say, because I, I mean, if I can't brag about it here, where can we brag about it? Our, our graduates in philosophy are just extraordinarily well represented in the field of philosophy, in the profession. They teach at colleges and universities you know, all over the country and all over the world. And I, before I came to read, I kept bumping into Reedies. I didn't know about Reed when I was your age. I didn't ever consider it as a college. I had never heard of it. But once I was a philosopher, I couldn't stop hearing about Reed. And right now we have students. Oh my gosh, Meg, can we list some of the yeah. student places? Yeah. So, well, I mean, one of my students is now, a, you know, a, a faculty member at University of Chicago. She and I did a Ginger. grant project over the summer. Yeah, Ginger Schultes. She and I did a grant project. So there are these other opportunities I could throw in here. But she and I um, wrote on Aristotle actually over one summer and um, wrote a paper together. Anyway, she went on. Superstar. Yeah. Um, I, I'll just go through a few. Like Milo was my thesis mm -hmm. student. He's teaching at Oxford now. He just finished his first year. Uh, we have four students right now at the University of Southern California, which is a top you know, five or six school. We have four students there and the same program program only has like 30 something students <laughs> it's ridiculous like i mean people at usc were you know just uh are talking to to and about our students are just floored by this uh we have somebody just graduated from michigan just got several job offers i mean she's whatever leaving right now uh we have one or two students at princeton i'm not sure whether it's just ellie there now we have one student at harvard right now yeah um it, it, it's kind of michigan uh, Notre Dame, we have a student. Mac is at Notre Dame. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to remember where everybody's at, but basically, like the top philosophy programs have a lot of readings. 
And that's a very, very ridiculously competitive thing to do. Uh, when I was on the graduate admissions committees elsewhere, we had like 300 to 350 applicants for like 15 spots, no backups. That was our numbers. And when I was there, before I came to read, I was on that committee maybe four years. Every year we would have one reedy like in our top 30 or so, you know, always in our final group would be a reedy. And that was honestly more than I could say for any other college or university, period. And read is tiny, right? So it, we, this process is a lot of work. When I came to read, I was like, what is the secret sauce? How are they doing this? How do they create these really great students? And I found out there isn't any secret sauce. You know, readies are special, but they're not like, you know, gods. Uh, read props are special, but they're not gods. It's actually just putting in the work. It's that there's careful attention and working on your skills until you, you know, to undertake this senior thesis very seriously. Senior theses are done a lot of places, but it's usually not everybody. And it's usually not as intensive, you know, over the course of a year uh, working with one faculty member. So it, it's really just what we're committed to and also kind of the peer pressure that sweeps you along at Reed because everybody does a senior thesis. So rather than you being like hanging out at the library in your senior year and working on your thesis while everyone else is just having fun, no, everyone else is suffering in the library right along with you. You're so having fun you're, I, I'm, with I'm your thesis. You're having fun with your thesis. Yes, I people, people, I shouldn't even say this because it plays into a little thing, right? But um, yeah, we like to have fun too. It's right. I think of philosophy as play. If it becomes work, it's kind of eh. But I think of it as play and I think you work harder when you play than when you work. <laughs> So we try to make it into play. I mean, that's the goal, right? And that's certainly what drew me in. I didn't come into philosophy like to go to the mines and work. I came into philosophy because it was a realm of mental enjoyment, imaginative play, right? So try to create that for you all. And it's collaborative too. I mean, the way I think of it is every class we write a paper. Like if the class goes well, we have together written a paper. And so the senior thesis is in some sense, I, in fact, I actually even encourage my students when they're thinking through you know, how to write something, it's like, okay, put yourself in class. You can kind of start hearing voices. It's like, oh, Troy would say this. And like, you know, this one would say that. And you can't, even just that mental act of imagining kind of what each person might say to you in a class, that's a paper. So there's some sense in which we um, we enact papers every class and we make them fun and collaborative. And what you're doing in when you're writing your own work is in some sense recreating that, but yet within your own consciousness. So there's no yeah. surprise in the end of the day when you write a good thesis because you just had, you just wrote a, you know, multiple papers every single class period. And that's because people actually come, and come having read <laughs> what they're supposed to read and have ideas. Everybody's excited. Does anybody feel like that? High school <laughs> conversations can feel like, okay. The hope is that when you come here, it won't feel like that. It'll be feel like fun. Like, I can't wait to get there to talk about this because it's going to be cool. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen yet. I'm going to lay my brick on top of somebody else's. But whatever we're going to build, it's going to be way cooler because I went to class. That's the hope. Okay. Um, and, so and even, anyway, but that's kind of a lot of stuff from us. I, what's yeah, happening yeah. in this chat? Is anybody, what do well, we have a, here? There's a, little, there's a little Aristotle bashing going on, Meg. You got to handle that one. Oh, okay, that's fine. I'm, I mean, I welcome that. Oh, he's wrong about almost all scientific knowledge from gravity to reproduction. Is that assessment accurate? Are there takeaways from classical science that we can use today? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. I don't think that's actually aerosol bashing. I think that's inviting, inviting people to distinguish. Okay, who's this person? What, let's see who, who asked this question. Alan, Alan, I don't think that you're aerosol bashing. I actually think what you're doing is you're trying to um, distinguish between the content of somebody's view and the methodology that one might actually take or, you know, kind of maybe other aspects of a uh, philosophical theory that might be worthy, despite the fact that the content isn't right. 
And then there's some question is like, well, why isn't the content right? Um, so is that would would that be a fair assessment of what you're asking, Ellen? Yeah, Where, so. Wherever you are, yeah. So I mean, if we think so, for example, um, I actually work on Aristotle's um, conception of the lowest level natural things, which are earth, air, fire, and water. Aristotle. Um, Aristotle thinks that these are the lowest level things. Okay, that doesn't seem to be right. But yet, I mean, do you like almost think of his periodic table as having four things? Um, yet, he has the sense that, um, that those things actually operate in a way um, that's not separate from how living things operate. He thinks that all things um, operate with purposes. And um, in that, in the case of the elements, even though they operate in ways that they must, given the kinds of things they are, there's nonetheless certain things that they do um, that are better than others. Now, you might think, okay, now I just made him sound even worse. Not only does he have the things wrong, <laughs> Um, but now he's saying some kind of really weird things about those things that they have goods that they seek to achieve. Um, but I think broadly, he is asking questions about how, for example, physics relates to biology or asking questions about how kind of how the how sciences hang together. Um, and those are really valuable questions that we can ask now. I mean, I can talk more about it, but but the point is there, there could be, um, there are, I think, some really valuable things that we can gain from it. Now, part of what's really fabulous about Aristotle too, is that he seems to think that answers that he gives in biology or in the sciences are related to the answers he's giving in ethics. And that's a really viable question too. So let's say he's even wrong about everything he says in, in, in science, okay? Even, even the stuff that I'm talking about now, like even the continuity between biology and physics, let's say. Let's say he's just wrong about all that stuff. He still has this other interesting question, which is, do we have to get science right to get ethics right? You know, right now, guess what? The scientists are on that side of campus. The ethicists are on this side of campus. They aren't really thinking that they are that their projects are related in the way that Aristotle does. Is that a mistake? Should the should the ethicist be over, you know, checking out what's going on in the science department? So one beautiful thing about Aristotle is that he's kind of doing everything. He's doing meteorology, he's doing uh, you know, physics, he's doing chemistry, he's doing um, ethics, he's doing politics. He thinks that they're all interrelated. So he's this incredible systematic thinker that kind of challenges the siloed way in which we currently operate in all of these disciplines. And he asks really important questions about the interrelationship between. So that's like to go way out. I could say more, Alan, feel free to email me. Thank you. you know, I, Aristotle, I, I, the movie critic. I, I just have to add that, you know, uh, yeah, it was a beautiful answer, Meg. But for me, reading Aristotle, some of what the way I think Meg and I read Aristotle is we're not look, reading Aristotle, you know, to find out how things move or mm -hmm. how things reproduce. Because why would you go to someone who lived, you know, in the fourth century before the common era to figure that out, <laughs> right? You, you don't go to Aristotle for answers about science, but it is interesting that virtually every discipline in science opens by saying, well, Aristotle, started this discipline when he said that blah 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 right as you see that in biology textbooks you see that in physics textbooks and then of course they then followed up with andy was wrong and but of most cases we didn't find out aristotle was wrong for like a thousand years <laughs> his his philosophy be, became adapted by the catholic church it became official church doctrine in some ways parts of it and um so some of the reason to read aristotle is just to read about the Western world and how it was created. It's, it's a whole way of thinking that shaped the world that we inherited, right? Some of it's historical, some of it's how he thought, 
And he thought some really loathsome things. A lot of Aristotle's opinions, not only they're wrong scientifically, but they do not match on to what we think ethically at all. Some of what Meg and I have learned in philosophy is how to read someone who's wrong about most everything and who thinks nothing like you and nevertheless find absolute delight and learn from that thinker who's utterly different from you and most of their views are loathsome. And yet, you know what I mean? So you, that's part of the education actually, because that's not just Aristotle, but that's like a lot of people you might read who are human beings who have left us their thoughts about the same questions that we think about. And they had very powerful, influential and insightful thoughts, despite being wrong about most stuff. And still you get, once you get inside their head, it's like an amazing space to be in. It's not just like talking to, you know, some random person. This is like, wow, there's a reason why everybody read Aristotle. There's a reason why this philosophy lasted a thousand years, you know, despite being full of falsehoods. There's something special about his mind, something amazing. And you can take the parts of Aristotle's mind. And just like Meg said earlier, when you invent these little discussions, for me, even though I, my, my dissertation, like I opened up by saying, this wasn't written by me. It was written by all the philosophers that I know and have read and have internalized, right? Inside my head is just this chorus of voices that I've collected over the years. They help me think, they think for me, right? And Aristotle's one of those voices, even though he's mostly wrong. Oh, Meg and um, uh, Tori, may I ask you this question? So we have all these questions from uh, some of our students. One of the things that I, I, I appreciate about philosophy is that it's like the father or the grandfather of so many different fields and fields study, like economics, you know, Adam Smith was a philosopher. You know, Newton was a natural philosopher. So today is like how much of like if students were to study philosophy and we, how are they able to study other areas of interest? How are they able to combine different areas? Maybe it's politicals, maybe it's economics or, you know, and, and, and do we have uh, courses or areas of philosophy that, that are non-Western, for example, and how that might look as well? Yeah, so that that was it looks like Troy may have had to step step away, which so you've got me. So this is just um, so what I would say is, yeah, this question about non-European philosophy, it's a good question. I'm open by saying that I'm teaching this philosophy course right now on the philosophy of memoir. So while I'm not teaching any, I guess I would say non-Western philosophy. Um, I'm nonetheless incorporating voices from a diverse group of people. I, um, because I'm opening with, for example, the, um, the voice of, of T. Bui, who is um, a, a refugee from Vietnam, and um, asking kind of what, kind of how do we understand her experience to relate to some of this philosophical literature that talks about meaning in life. Um, and in the middle of the class, we read from this, oh, I guess I don't have it sitting right here, but we read from this reader called Visibility, Disability Visibility, where it's first personal accounts of people living with disabilities. And one of the accounts actually is of um, somebody who engaged Peter Singer, I don't know if you're familiar with Peter Singer, but Peter Singer is a philosopher um, with whom uh, a lot of disability rights groups have kind of an ongoing, um, I, I don't know if it would call it a debate, but there's, there's an ongoing question about Peter Singer and how he relates to the disability rights community. So anyway, I, what I do is I have my students think about Peter Singer's philosophical arguments and how they engage with the first personal account of a person living with a disability who engages Peter Singer in argument and um, kind of what he includes and excludes from philosophical um, debate and what um, uh, his interlocutor who is living with a disability thinks should be included and excluded from debate. So we kind of, I guess what I would say is, and then we, we have other voices. I, we read Alexander Chi um, and hit, the book is um, how to write an autobiographical novel. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So this is all by way of saying, 
my class this semester is um, I'm doing, you know, Western philosophy, I guess, but it's it's decentering um, majority voices and challenging what philosophy might look like. Um, when it engages first personal testimony of people who are marginalized. So, you know, it's, it's doing some of that. Now, um, we don't, but we don't have anybody in our department who's doing um, non-Western philosophy. We have some um, folks in the religion department. We have, um, you know, a Chinese humanities class. There are other places where you can in, engage in um, non-Western philosophy. And I had one student, actually one student came back recently. He was my student maybe 10 or 15 years ago who took a lot of courses in religion and took Chinese and um, is now pursuing a law degree. But he's an example of somebody who kind of did both, I guess, um, but not within the philosophy department. But he found taking classes in the philosophy department really valuable um, for uh, his pursuits outside the philosophy department as well. And I could, I could, I'm sure he's somebody that would be interested in talking with you if you wanted to hear a little bit more about how he kind of combined um, departments here at Reed to kind of chart his own course um, because you can also do these interdisciplinary majors so we have some majors that are kind of on the books as interdisciplinary so for example in um the um in, uh environmental studies and then we have what's called an ad hoc interdisciplinary major which means like you create it yourself and you have to convince us that it's something that that you are pursuing a degree that would not be able to be pursued within a single department. And then you essentially write your own requirements and it has to be approved by both departments. And then you are kind of, you write one thesis, but kind of on the borderlands. So that's another way to pursue it. Okay, somebody's asking about a musical branch of philosophy. I mean, I. I, I haven't had anybody do that, or I haven't heard of anyone doing it at the time since, but I will say, it seems like if you want to do that, that I don't see why not. I mean, it, it depends on what you're envisioning, but if it gets into um, mathematics and the real interrelationship between mathematics and music, and I don't know, I'm just trying to imagine what it is, but my colleague, Paul Havda would be somebody you might want to email he he is he works on as Trey mentioned formal logic um, and also the relationship between philosophy and music and independently he has a really serious interest in music so I would email email him and see what you have in mind um, because he's kind of a serious music person too. Um, let me see here I'm scrolling scrolling scrolling. Um, is philosophy of politics taught at Reed under this department? Um, yeah, so we, there's a course right now that Mark Badeau is teaching um, in um, history of modern and, uh, uh, let's see, history of modern social and political philosophy. Um, so you could talk with him. There's also some courses taught in the um, political science department that students have taken that are again on the borderlands of philosophy and, and political science. And I have, you know, I have advised theses myself, like on Rawls, so is my um, colleague Steve Arkanovich, who focuses on uh, ethics. Both of us have advised theses on these kinds of topics. Um, I'm still running through here. Uh, you know, yell out if I haven't properly answered your question. For example, Aaron, you asked the last question, and um, my other friend up here, um, Nuala, asked a question about non European philosophy. 
Um, Wait, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. How, how easy or how difficult is it for students, you know, especially those who are doing their thesis, to have two advisors, maybe like have an advisor from different departments, philosophy and something else that they, especially if they're considering an interdisciplinary, you know, a thesis, for example. Interdis how difficult is it to do an interdisciplinary thesis? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you have to have a, it depend, it's only difficult if you have a bad reason. Um, what I would say is if you have a good reason that it shouldn't be difficult, if you don't have a good reason that it would be difficult. Um, I, but how common is it? That might be a different kind of question that could ind indicate whether people often have good reasons. And I would say, in the end of the day, you might think that you want to do something ahead of time, but when you get to the department, you get interested in a lot of things and you end up finding something within philosophy, or you come here and you do political science and you do philosophy and you decide like, oh, actually, what I'm actually thinking about is maybe more kind of centered in, in political science. So I'll go ahead and take a lot of classes in philosophy, but I'll write my thesis. In. So that's kind of more likely to happen. But I don't want to foreclose, you know, the option for anybody. I, I can imagine doing it. Um, you could keep it in, keep it's the options always available to you if you end up having a good reason to do it that way. But I will say that, um, you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to tell um, until you've shown up over here which thing you want to do. That's in part because in high school you didn't take likely, I mean, some high schools do, not that many high schools teach philosophy, not that many high schools teach political science, not many high schools teach, you know, anthropology, sociology, like in, in some sense, you kind of have to be in it to get the feel of it, to see what you like. And I would just encourage you to come on by. Don't worry, we'll figure it out. Whatever it is that you want to do, I'm pretty confident that you can find, find some way to, some way to do it. Um, or something enough adjacent that you feel like your interest is satisfied. And if you have a particular question, please do. I'm going to put my email in here right now, but you know, continue the conversation with me by all means. That's my email. So Paul Havda, by the way, is the philosopher, philosopher, mathematician, musician. And then the second thing is my email, charlie at reed.edu. And then I'm sure Troy would share um, his email too. And you can look it up on the website. But anyway, I think it's cross T. Anyway, you want to put it in there. Um, I think it's cross T at read.eu, but just double, you mind double checking it. Um, okay, so going up here. Oh, any topics taught on the philosophy of war? That's a great topic. Um, I guess one thing to mention is that, um, you all, when you come to read, will take Humanities 110. And uh, I'm, when I'm thinking about philosophy of war, you know, I'm just put in mind of, I teach in, in Humanities 110, so does Troy, so does Paul, so, so does um, Steve Arkonovich, who also teaches in ethics. All of us teach in Humanities 110 as well. And you are going to read some texts in that class that will be, broadly speaking, on the philosophy of war. And it could also be the case that in an ethics class, you will be reading texts on the philosophy of war. I mean, arguably the, the philosophy is war, of war is a topic in my memoir class because we talk about um, the relationship between philosophy and history. And in particular, the Vietnam War um, as it's, as it's um, presented in that graphic memoir I mentioned, um, the T buoys, the best we could do. Okay, scrolling here. Is there a book you recommend reading before starting college this fall? Wow, that's a really good question. Okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna answer it eventually here. Uh, I've, let me just let it percolate in the back. Um, are there, any classes that involve creative writing and philosophy? Okay, great question. So you could, no one has, but you could um, write a, uh, 
philosophy, creative writing interdisciplinary major. We have at Reed, Pete Rock is in the um, creative writing department and he teaches uh, personal narrative, memoir, um, that kind of, we also have a poet, but um, Pete would be kind of maybe more, unless you're thinking about philosophical poetry, which is possible. Um, but I could imagine somebody, and now I'm just spinning it up on my own over here. Who, who's my, let's see, who's this person that's asking this? Tess. Okay, Tess, I'm spinning out your question and you know, feel free to follow up with me. But what I would say is, why not? I mean, memoir by its very nature is philosophical because you know, in memoir, you're not only um, kind of giving a personal account of what happened, but you're also sharing a kind of analysis of what happened or a kind of philosophical analysis of what happened. So I could see, you know, now I'm not 100% sure that kind of depending on the nature of the thesis, I don't know if it would really work as an interdisciplinary or maybe just write the creative writing thesis and take a lot of philosophy classes. I have a student who graduated actually, who is a, I guess this is, okay, I said it wasn't done. It, it actually was, but it was done after graduation. So I had a, had a student who wrote his thesis with me, who now writes plays for um, productions in, in London, theatrical productions and has written plays on philosophical themes that he studied with me and in our department and kind of in his thesis. And so he's a creative writer whose roots are in philosophy. He didn't do an interdisciplinary major, but you know, anything's possible is what I'm saying. Um, let's see, is there, okay, I'm still thinking about the book. Okay, now moving down, how much of a boost that e Reed's education prepares students to wanna to pursue graduate studies um, compared to universities like NYU or Rutgers? Okay, I can't, I don't think I can speak to NYU and Rutgers because I have not been there, but I will say that I was at, you know, I went to, I, I did my graduate work at a major um, research university. And I do think that having access directly to professors and working closely with professors and potentially, and always writing a senior thesis with professors and um, having opportunities to do summer collaborative research with professors is really valuable, especially in philosophy. So I will say, I have a son who's a junior who is interested in philosophy. And I am really, really, really sad because he doesn't wanna to come to where, you know, most people don't wanna go where their mother is and there's a small department. But I'm just saying I'm sad about it because I can't, I mean, I don't have a lot of personal experience with a lot of, you know, inside departments, but I, I would add, he would do so well here that I'm kind of sad I'm here. Um, and I wish he could work with my colleagues. I really wish. So I don't know that I want to, you know, speak to the exact parallels between here and other places, but all I can say is I am 100% confident that he would become a really great philosopher in this department, but his, you know, you all are so lucky you're not my children. You could come here and it wouldn't be a problem. Um, okay. Oh, well, Matt, maybe you should let us talk to uh, to your kid first and maybe have admission office convince him to uh, reconsider. Well, they have, it turns <laughs> out that your admissions office is trying to contact him. <laughs> you're already working on that. Absolutely. But um, yeah, you have to remove this obstacle first. Uh, right. okay. we, we are down to our last two minutes. Yeah, it's we'll, a second we'll, minute. We'll kind of okay, like okay. so questions. people are putting in good books. That's great. Oh my goodness, the book. The book thing has get, got me. Um, I don't know. I almost feel like I need to think about it. I, there, I think that um, one thing you could do to find a book, let's put it this, I'm gonna give you a method to find a book as opposed to find, um, instead of giving you the book. How many of you are familiar with the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy? Okay, cool. 
So that's that's where you could find something to read. You basically type into the, you could go to plato.stanford.edu or just type into Google um, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Literally any topic that you're interested in philosophy, it'll pop up with kind of like, here's the state of the literature on this. And there's a great bibliography at the end. That could be a great way to start. I, I think philosophy is best done when you start with your honest interest. Like what do you, what are the questions that you want to ask and kind of start with that and then just keep going and never stop. That's, so I guess I, I'm gonna give you the method, not the answer to that question. And then finally, is there any final thing? Uh, Aristotle's way, how ancient wisdom can change. Okay, so there's some suggestions in here. Very good. Um, I just encourage all of you, since we're at the end of our time together, thank you so much for your questions. And um, I put my, uh, I hope I didn't skip somebody. My apologies if I did, because you all are so many. And I wanna make sure that I've um, not skipped anyone accidentally here. Again, I put my email there. Feel free to email me. And you know, I might be seeing some of you very soon in one of our classes. Well, thank you so much, Meg. And uh, uh, I'm sure if I will, I will send an email to, to Troy, thanking him as well. And thank you to everyone here for participating. I hope this was helpful in terms of like, you know, getting a glimpse of what it means to study philosophy and read. And I have to say, like, you know, of all my interaction with everyone from the philosophy department, it is one of the most engaging departments. Like, you know, I remember going to college, my professors, you know, just sat on his like chair and spoke for two hours straight and never asked any questions. And really, that is not the case. It's a very dynamic, it's very engaging, you know, learning experience. So I hope you get the chance to uh, maybe sit in, in, in uh, Meg's class. And if you come to read that, you uh, you will be one of the students uh, next fall as well. Um, with yeah. that, have a wonderful uh, night. Uh, thank you so much for participating. And we will share with you the link to the recording. So if you have friends or whoever who might want to watch this, we will uh, give you the chance to, uh, to review it. Thank you, everyone.